Thank you. I'll, I'll really quickly uh, just introduce uh, our next speaker then coming up. Uh, our next speaker is Francois Wouts. I uh, hope I've got that right again. Um, he's a developer happiness engineer at Airtasker, which is a pretty awesome title. And uh, Francois is going to be talking about contact first API development using Spot. Um, again, if, if you have any questions, please just throw them in the chat and um, or wait until the end, and then um, we'll ask some questions. So um, thank you, Francois. Hi, everyone. Um, is the mic working? Everything seems to be seems to be A1. Awesome. OK. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Francois. And I'm here to talk about contract-first API developments. So I'm a software engineer at Airtasker. Um, what I'm really passionate about is developer tooling um, and the entire developer workflow in general, what leads to code actually getting out in a safe and productive way. So instead of a software engineer, I like to call myself a developer happiness engineer. This is not my official title. So Airtasker has three client apps. We have a web app, which is built with React and TypeScript. We have an Android app built with Kotlin. And lastly, we have an iOS app in Swift. Our teams are cross-functional. So typically on a team, you will find um, an engineer who's more inclined to do web work, Android, iOS, and of course, API slash backend. In practice, things are a bit more blurry than that because we encourage people to uh, cross skill um, across different stacks and really contribute to whatever they're interested in. But that's kind of a, the foundation of a, a team at Atasker. Of course, we also have uh, a UX designer. This is what a UX designer actually looks like at Atasker. Uh, and we have product managers. This is not what they look like. So let's look at the typical development process uh, up to until about two years ago at Atasker. First, of course, the product manager decides to release a new feature, in this case, bookings on web. The backend engineer looks at that and says, cool, I'll implement an API endpoint to fetch bookings so that we can display them in the, app, the, in, in the app. A couple of days later, the API engineer says, done, the endpoint is slash bookings. Now the web engineer is ready to start working and they ask, where do I find the scheduled date? It turns out the endpoint returns the list of bookings, but it doesn't actually include everything we need to display in the UI according to the mocks that were provided by the UX designer. So the API engineer says, oh, sorry, uh, let me add this to the endpoint. A couple of days later, I come back saying, here, I've added schedule date as an int timestamp, but it can be null too. And the web engineer is happy, goes and implement the feature, and we launch. Everything goes well. The app is very successful. The new feature is successful. Uh, everyone is using it on web. So now, the web in, uh, one month later, the product manager says, let's launch it on iOS. The iOS engineer says, what's the endpoint called? And the API engineer says, slash bookings. So now the, the iOS engineer tries it out. Uh, loads slash bookings in the, in the dev environment, sees what kind of stuff it returns. It's the, they see a schedule date field, et cetera. So all good. Um, and we push a new version of iOS with, which has this new feature, except something goes wrong. JSON digitalization error expected int got null for property scheduled dates. The iOS engineer is confused. Why would it return null? Now, the backend engineer knows the answer. Of course, it's expected to have null for canceled bookings. The iOS engineer had no idea because they looked at the, the bookings endpoint, at least at the response that it gave, and it looked to always return an int. So now uh, they have to release an emergency fix on iOS and just hope that people upgrade to the latest version. What happened here? Well, a few things. First, of course, the iOS app crashed. Uh, that's not good. We don't want that. Uh, 
uh, crashes generally don't result in uh, more revenue. But also the web engineer at the beginning was blocked for a few days because they had to wait until the API was fully implemented. And actually they had to wait twice, first for the initial implementation to be ready. And then when they realized that something was missing from that, they had to again, wait for the API to be reworked to include everything they needed. Now, why did this happen? A couple of reasons. One, and actually the main thing, the API was not documented. So there was there were informal discussions between people. Uh, there was there was a rough understanding of what was expected from the endpoint, but there was at no point any clear documentation of what the endpoint will return. And especially uh, the iOS engineer simply inferred what looked like was the, the response payload uh, incorrectly, actually. More importantly, client engineers were not consulted throughout the entire process. So whatever uh, endpoints is given to them is what they have to work with. Uh, it is quite possible, as we'll see later, that you may come up with a better design for this endpoint. Now, let's look at an alternative. This is contract first development process. And this is the way that we do things at Itasker nowadays. So the same thing, product manager starts and says, let's launch bookings on web. Now, the API engineer says something a little bit different. Okay, I will start designing an API to fetch bookings. Note that they said design, not implement. A few minutes later, they come back and say, here's a draft API contract. Now, this is what it looks like. It's a Google doc in this case. And it's a very simple doc. All it says is get slash bookings. We return a list of booking objects. A booking is made of the following fields, ID, name, string, description, string, et cetera, et cetera. So everything is in there. And now people can comment on it because it's, this is a Google doc. So the web engineer looks at it and compares that to the mocks that he saw uh, in, um, in the UX design and says, how about we add scheduled date as well so that we can render everything. And the API engineer is very happy to add that. It's a one line change. Yep, I've added scheduled date of type int or null. Now the Android engineer looks like it, at it as well and has one suggestion. What if we did the scheduled date rendering on the server side? So we format the date on the server side and instead, we just always have a string. Easy, done. Now, the iOS engineer looks at it as well and notices that maybe we haven't considered the case where there are lots of bookings. What Will the endpoint be paginated? And yeah, so that was actually overlooked. So now the API engineer says, I've added a pagination cursor. Now everyone's happy. Everyone comments on the doc saying, that looks good to me. I'm happy with this. Let's go ahead. Only at that point, the backend engineer will go and implement this API. So now everyone's happy. In terms of documentation, there are a few ways to do this. What I've shown you here is a Google Doc, but that's only one of the options. So sharing a doc is simple. It's very helpful. It's super collaborative. As long as you can comment easily, that's really, you can use whatever platform that allows you to do that. And it does lead to a better API as we've just seen. The only thing is that you can forget to document things. It's a Google doc after all. Uh, you, you're only detail, as detailed as you want to be, make it. So for example, we may completely forget to cover what kind of error codes we could expect or what are the edge cases, et cetera, et cetera. It's also an informal review process. So at Atasker, for example, we use GitHub pull requests for everything. There's no not one line of code that goes into the code base without having been reviewed by someone else first. Um, in this case, in Google Doc, all you can do is potentially have a convention that people comment with saying, looks good to me. Um, but if someone doesn't comment, you don't really know whether they've seen it, whether they're happy with it, et cetera. And Lastly, it easily gets out of date. So we have this first uh, API engineer who um, created great documentation, et cetera. But what if a few months later, someone else wants to make changes to these uh, endpoints and they change the code, but they don't even know that this doc exists. So then that becomes out of date. So it can diverge quite quickly. <clears throat> 
And an alternative that a lot of you may already be familiar with is OpenAPI, uh, which used to be called Swagger. So here's an example I pulled from the official website. Um, here we have an endpoint, which is slash bet. This is a post endpoint, as you can see here. Um, it has a bunch of descriptions. It's uh, available in both JSON and XML, and it takes a request body. And that request body is of type pet. So here where you see dollar ref, that's basically a shortcut to another place in the YAML. Uh, so here, let's look at that place. So in under the definitions key in the OpenAPI file, here we have pet type objects. It has a few required fields, a name and photo URLs, and then it defines all of the properties that you can expect here. So you have ID, which is an int 64, category, which is defined by another type somewhere else in the file, et cetera, et cetera. So this is super uh, thorough and everything is documented here. Let's look at a concrete example with a simple API. So here I have an endpoint post slash users, and it expects an email and a password, which are both strings. Uh, this is of course a password that I use on every platform online. Uh, and it returns a 201 created response with just a user ID, which is a string. So simple endpoint, let's see, it. Let's see how we can implement it with OpenAPI. Well, how we can describe it. First, we define the path. So slash users post. Then we choose an operation ID, in this case, create user. And then we input a request body. So here we say the request body is going to be required and it's of type create user request, which we'll define right after. And same, the response is 201 create user response. In terms of definitions, we define create user request type object with properties email and password, which are both string, and create user response user ID string. Now, if you're familiar with OpenAPI, you might realize that we're missing something. Um, actually, in OpenAPI, all properties by default are optional. So what we need to do is also add required email and password and required user ID here. So that's a full description of our um, endpoints. OpenAPI has the advantage of being very structured. It's an official format. It's open source. There's lots of uh, community around it. It can describe most REST APIs, whether it's JSON or XML. The only thing is that it's fairly complex. So I was considering including a slide of myself scrolling through the spec, um, but that would have taken too long. It is 56 pages. It is very extensive. There are lots of really good examples, but it's a lot to digest. It can be a bit difficult to write by hand, uh, as we'll see a little bit later. Uh, and what we've noticed at a tasker especially is that reviewing a diff uh, for example, in a GitHub pull request of a massive YAML file, it's not easy. Uh, and actually, it's sometimes a little bit discouraging. So the we didn't get the engagement that we wanted uh, in terms of PR reviews. We wanted to make it as smooth as possible, and that didn't quite fit the bill. Fortunately, there are GUI editors to um, be able to write OpenAPI a little bit more easily. So there are quite a few of them. Uh, this is from openapi.tools, which I highly recommend checking out. Uh, I think one of the most advanced is probably Stoplight, which um, is, I don't know, I get ads for it, et cetera, all the time. It, it looks really powerful. Um, disclaimer, I haven't used it firsthand a lot, uh, but it is a really helpful tool, I think, for, for editing OpenAPI. As you can see, you have a very useful visualization of what you're writing instead of just staring at a big YAML file. So GUI editors are really great for editing. The only thing is that in our case, what we want is especially collaboration and having the ability to review an API design quite easily. And for that, we want to use GitHub pull requests. And that didn't quite fill the bill. The, the editor is outside of uh, GitHub. You can potentially you know, open up the branch, uh, open the editor on that branch, and then manually kind of figure out what changed. Um, but this is not the, the kind of workflow that the smooth GitHub workflow that we're used to. So our client engineers here are not super happy with this. Now, one thing to realize is that our REST API, at least at a tasker, is just JSON. And I would bet that your API as well is JSON if you're using REST. 
Uh, XML, I think it's kind of dying right now. <laughs> so JSON is JavaScript object notation. That's what it stands for. And JavaScript nowadays has types. It's called TypeScript, and that's a really powerful language built by Microsoft. So what if we use TypeScript? On the left here, I have an example, JSON payload. So it says name, colon, spot, and stars 151. And on the right, we have the, the corresponding type written in TypeScript. So it looks very similar, as you can see, instead of var is type. And here we say name, colon, string, and stars, colon, number. So that's the foundation for Spot. Spot is an open source project that we've created at Itasker. You can check it out here. I will reshare the link at the end. Uh, but Spot is basically leveraging TypeScript to make API design a lot easier. So looking back at the API that we had earlier, so email password returning user ID. First, we'll define the type for each of the objects. So here, type create user request equals email colon string, password colon string. Type create user response, user ID colon string. So far, so good. Then this is where it gets a little bit more uh, complex, I would say. We actually describe the endpoint. So here we use a TypeScript annotation saying at endpoint method colon post path slash users. And then we say that there's a request, which is a type create user request, and that there's a response 201 that is the success and the returns create user response. By the way, you can have multiple responses, of course, for different status codes. This is the entire description of, of the API in Spot. So let's compare that to OpenAPI. Of course, I had to reduce the font size to make it fit on the slide, but this is um, really a one-to-one -one mapping between the two. The nice thing about TypeScript is that it's a lot more expressive because, of course, it's a much more expressive language than YAML, simply. Um, and it's designed to describe JavaScript and therefore JSON. TypeScript is almost intuitive. Here, I've made the request a little bit more complex just to be a little bit more realistic. realistic. You can see there are a few things. Here, we have a location question mark location. What this means is that the field can be omitted. So if I get a request that only has email and password, that's valid. And if I get an email and password and location, then location needs to conform to the type location. Then we have this pipe here. What this means is it's an or. So here, suburb can be string or null. Effectively, that makes the field nullable. So I have to set a suburb, but I can set it to null. And lastly here, this is a string in them. So country can be either the string AU or the string UK or the string FR. It cannot be any other string. Again, let's look at the equivalent open API. That's all of it. Um, I don't know about you, but I personally find the left side slightly easier to read. But the core of spots what Spot is really good at is developer experience. And that's really what we wanted to facilitate. You don't need a GUI editor to work with Spot. You just use any editor that supports TypeScript, for example, VS Code. So here I've recorded myself actually creating this API endpoint with Spot. So the first thing is I wrote down an example payload. This is not necessary, but it's just helpful for me. So email and password. Then I'm gonna to try to create a type that matches this. So here I have email and password. Notice the typo. So now I'm gonna change my payload to have the type, the corresponding type. And here it's not happy, right? I did not mean to write password. I meant to add a D. Yep, now it's good. And I'm gonna define the response. And lastly, we just need to define the actual endpoint that uses this request and res response. So here, autocomplete method, you can see I can just pick one of the methods 
I set the path. And here we use the keyword class, but it's just a DSL. So create user, just the name of the endpoint. And we define the body of the request. And lastly, the response. Also using the add body annotation. There's a little bit of red here. When I hover over it, it's because actually I forgot to call this. It takes a config status to a one. And we're done. So now we have the endpoint completely described with Spot. So Spot has the advantage of being structured, just like OpenAPI. It's much easier to write. It's also really easy to review diffs because it's just reviewing simple TypeScript code. This is exactly the same process that we, we do, for example, for our web code. And on top of that, cheer on top, edit, you get auto, editor autocomplete. The only thing, of course, is that it's limited to JSON. Now, the workflow we spot is first, someone will write a draft of the API contract. And they will do that directly in their editor. That someone doesn't actually have to be a backend engineer. It can be anyone. In, in fact, at Atasker, we see that it, it's, it can be really uh, a web engineer. It can be an Android engineer. Sometimes it's a backend engineer. It really doesn't really matter. Because after that, you send a PR to interested engineers, typically your entire team, to gather feedback and make sure that you're designing the right thing. Once everyone's happy, you merge it. And then in parallel, a few things can happen. The API engineer will implement this API. And at the same time, client engineers will implement the new features based on this API. Note that I say at the same time. That's because you can, for example, use a mock server. You don't have to wait for the API to be completely implemented. Or you can use test-driven development, et cetera, et cetera. This upfront API design facilitates parallel developments. You may have noticed that here, there is this initial friction of coming up with the API contracts, getting it reviewed, and only after that being like allowed to write code. But this is an alternative to writing code, then getting feedback that it's probably not correct, and then having to re rework several times potentially. Um, so this is, you would argue, not agile, but I think it is actually um, an agile um, process. What about OpenAPI? Why would you use Spot? Because it's this completely different tool that is on its own um, and goes away from OpenAPI. But actually, Spot generates OpenAPI. Turns out OpenAPI is great at a lot of things. It's perfect for writing a bunch of tooling on top. So Spot can simply take that TypeScript uh, that we wrote and generate OpenAPI from that. Based on that, we've created a bunch of tooling. First, you get documentation really easily just by doing spot docs api.ts. You get client code generation. Um, we leverage open API generators. So on, if you're using Swift, I would highly recommend using SwiftGen. You cannot make any implementation mistakes anymore because the client engineers are simply not writing the code that calls the API. They're simply using the auto-generated code. We have API contract testing because it's important to make sure that the actual implementation of the backend conforms to the API contract. You can read more about this on our wiki. And we have linting based on API guidelines. So at Etasco, we have a bunch of API guidelines to ensure consistency across different endpoints and also to just make sure that we don't make mistakes that will make um, backwards compatibility hard. Uh, that just does all these checks for you. And lastly, we have a mock API server. So you can just call that, and you have a server running immediately within a few seconds. Is Spot good for my team? I would say probably. Um, you don't need to be familiar with TypeScript. In fact, Adai Tasker has been adopted by Ruby engineers who had no experience with types, typed languages, and of course, Kotlin and Swift engineers who are, for whom it's just super simple. Uh, it's easy to integrate into your existing PR review process. You don't have to change anything, really. Of course, it's limited to JSON REST APIs. So it's an alternative to things like GraphQL, gRPC, and Thrift. Uh, 
it's actually inspired by gRPC. So it's not trying to compete. Um, it's only if you want a JSON API, Spot is probably a good tool for you. And it's really still early days. So while it's open source, we haven't put uh, enough love in our documentation, for example. So if you check it out, you may notice that it's a little bit rough. Uh, the wiki has a lot of information, so do check it out. Uh, but any contributions are really welcome here. If you want to learn more, this is where you can check it. Just check the Airtasker uh, organization on GitHub. And yeah, that's that's about it for me. Thank you. Thank you, um, Francois. Um, if uh, anybody has questions that they'd like to ask about Spot, um, please just throw them in the chat. Um, I was kind of wondering um, with this sort of thing, have you found any strategies for dealing with developers who might sort of resist um, having to document everything thoroughly before they're allowed to um, start developing? So when, when I say when I say you're not allowed to start developing, I, I lied a little bit. You're you're definitely allowed to write code and um, you know get your code ready, but you're not you won't be allowed to merge it into master until everyone has agreed to the API. So you, you can definitely start working. It's just the idea is really to avoid unnecessary work, and that's just beneficial for everyone. Uh, if you know that your API endpoint is not going to be uh, very contentious, um, of course, it makes sense to start working on it early on. Uh, we haven't actually gotten really much uh, friction there. The, we had a lot of friction when we started using OpenAPI because OpenAPI was a bit of a pain. Um, but with Spot, it ha hasn't been an issue, really. OK. And I was wondering if there are any, um, I know I've encountered some issues translating OpenAPI spec um, directly uh, into C sharp a few times. I was wondering if the uh, jumping from TypeScript into open API spec, any problems with that sort of thing? Yeah. So uh, we've actually, we one problem that we found and that I didn't have time to mention is that a lot of open API code generators are not very good. Um, they don't go, they tend to assume, um, they tend to be a, a bit too uh, allowing of, of, uh, of data mm -hmm. being whatever shape. Uh, so we actually ended up building our own open API generators for TypeScript and Kotlin. Uh, but on Swift, we, we could just use SwiftGen already. And we just uh, did a, a couple of PRs on the open source project to make sure that it's perfectly to our standard. But it, it was already really, really good. OK, fantastic. Um, thank you very much. It looks like the talk might. Um be running out of time. Uh, will you be available to answer any more questions in the chat if people are sure. curious? Sure. Sweet. All right. Um, thank you very much then for your time.